Hey guys, thanks for coming. Oh my god, I've never had this before. <laughs> so crazy. So given the fact that her Comedy Central show is called Inside Amy Schumer, you probably think you know everything about her. <laughs> but hopefully you don't. Otherwise, this is going to be a super boring Q&A. So let's run down the basics of what we do now. Amy has done years of stand-up, made it to the finals of Last Comic Standing, absolutely. Blam! <laughs> she killed it with her legendary burns at the roast of Charlie Sheen and Roseanne Barr. She's had numerous comedy specials and of course created the sketch show Inside Amy Schumer, which begins its third season in April? Yeah. April 21st, I think. April 21st, thank you, Five. She's also hosting this year's MTV Movie Awards, and there's a little matter of transitioning into a major movie star. Hmm. She wrote and stars in the new film Trainwreck, the ridiculously hilarious and unexpectedly sweet Judd Apatow-directed comedy, which absolutely slayed last night Murdered. at its premiere here. <laughs> She's constantly challenging the norm. She isn't afraid of the word feminism, capital F, and could make a parked car burst out laughing. Please welcome Amy Schumer. Thank you for that. You're welcome. That was really good. Thank you. I worked Thank really you. hard on oh that. Oh my god, it's perfect. Can you be my? Are you my mother? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so your film premiered last night. Rave reviews. How does that feel? Insane. Like it feels. Um, it feels super surreal. Like this, I think this moment feels the most surreal of anything. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, three years ago, I was like begging to get half off my wings at a comedy club. <laughs> so this is the best. And it was so fun to watch the movie last night. I hadn't seen that cut of it, and I just watched it like a movie. I don't feel like any connection to myself up there. Like, you know, the story, of course, but I like the movie, so it was so fun. It was such a great crowd. Everybody went bananas for it. They missed yes. half the jokes because they were laughing so hard. God bless. <laughs> so when is the first time you remember making someone laugh and realizing, oh, this is for me? This is I what actually I'm do. totally know the answer to this. Really? I, I was playing um, Gretel in The Sound of Music, and uh, I love a good Nazi musical. <laughs> and. Uh, and every time I would come out on stage, I was five, and every time I would come out on stage, everybody would laugh. And I felt really stupid and humiliated, and, I, I, and the director could see that. Like, I would get angry and frustrated every time I spoke, or they would laugh, because it was a little girl. Like, and, and, and she was like, she explained to me, no, Amy, it's, it's good. When you make people laugh, you make them feel better, they're happy, and um, it's, a, it's a great thing. So it was really explained to me that it was good and then I had this just kind of ability. Like sometimes people just like look at me and start laughing. Just <laughs> and, and I yeah, so I, I embraced it at five years old. And what were you like as a kid? Like were you always entertaining people? Was that your Yeah. I, my, my dad would always filmed us and it was always I just wanted a captive audience and I would make up stories as I went along, just like uh, I'd be like, guys, everybody to the living room. I have a very good story I've crafted, and then it would be clear I'd be making it up as I went along, and about like two rabbits that were friends, and uh, and they weren't good, but my parents were like amazing, like let's get the neighbors over here to hear this. So I was brought up with a very false sense of uh, <laughs> of security. Just my parents really made me think I was the best, and it wasn't until later that I realized that they were lying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But what did you want to be when you grow up? I, I've always wanted to perform and entertain. I, I've never had a backup plan. But I don't know. I still don't have any goals. You know what I mean? Like, I've never. <laughs> it's like I wanted to stop um, bartending and, and stop. S my last job was sorting mail. And uh, well, I had to stop bartending because I didn't want to talk to people anymore. <laughs> you know, because like, oh, that's so interesting. Where are you from? And then, uh, and then I. Yeah, I, was, I had a job sorting mail, and I only talked to the mailman. And uh, and what was the question? <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, Wait, yeah, you... so I never had a plan, and I still don't. I, I, I didn't even make a decision to become a comedian. It seriously just kind of happened. And were you really in Newsies, is my question. No, I think it's so funny. Do you funny. know this rumor is everywhere? I like to lie. Like, everywhere? I love lying in interviews, specifically. Um, Great, can't wait. 
Yeah, no, but when it's someone you know who doesn't know who you are at all, like I told somebody last year, they're like, what was your favorite scene to shoot this year on your show? And I was like, definitely, I was hanging off, I was in Dubai and I was hanging off the Burj Khalifa <laughs> and I pissed myself and they're just like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then they, you know, they printed it and so I was like, oh, that's so fun. So, <laughs> yeah, just like, there's a lot of lies. But I loved Newsies growing up and I'm sure I said in some interview that I was a Newsie, but that's, that's a lie. Like, I was a, I'm a girl. Well, I think <laughs> I've always had ovaries. There was a sketch on Inside Amy Schumer where you were in maybe heaven and it was like a grocery store and you said the, the soundtracks of Rent and Newsies are playing yeah. all the time. Well, that's exactly what my dream would be, yes. <laughs> um, so a lot of people don't know this, or again, maybe this audience does, but you were a theater major in college yeah. and you're classically trained as an actress. Yeah. So was comedy a natural, was stand-up a natural progression from that or stand-up um, just because you weren't getting what you wanted? Well, no, I mean, as soon as I uh, graduated college, I moved back to New York and was just waiting tables and auditioning. And then I joined like an abusive improv group and, uh, <laughs> You know, I didn't like, could this like be more comfortable? Um, and I, uh, I went to see one of the girls in my, girls, she was like 60, but one of the chicks in my troupe, if you can imagine how great this improv troupe was. Uh, she was doing stand up and, and she just ate it so hard. And I was like, I could do that, I could, I could bomb. So I just tried it, I tried it and I loved it. And, uh, but yeah, like, because that's the thing. I think some people in LA will, be like, oh, I'm, I want to find an agent. Last call. Um, <laughs> you don't have to go home. You can't. Uh, so, but stand up isn't a means to anything. Like in New York, you can't get industry to come see. Like if you do a show in LA, even the shittiest show, there will be like five suits there, you know? But in New York, if someone's like, oh, an agent is here, you'd be like, are they lost? Like nobody comes to see you to scout you or anything. So, it really was just that I, I really liked doing it. And it didn't, I didn't know I could make a living from it or anything, it's just, it just happened. And you were pretty idealistic, at least. You said last night that um, young girls have this idealistic feeling and you kept it for a longer time than most. Well, the, I kept, um, I, I felt confident and it, I didn't even, I, I just didn't know to question myself, which was great. I think you should hold on to that as long as you can as possible. It's just, when I was a little girl who was really confident and, and I referenced the Sophia Grace on, uh, that's on Ellen all the time singing. Yeah, just like these little girls, they don't like, nobody tells them like, suck your belly in. Like, you know, nobody's, <laughs> nobody's put that doubt in you yet. And I, I was able to hold on to that, I think longer than, longer than a lot of people, just because my parents were good liars. And uh, <laughs> I remember being really surprised when, when I got any sort of negative feedback. Like, you know, kids are mean and um, and I'm just, I, everything I do is kind of working to get back to that place of like, I'm a human being and I'm not going to apologize for uh, something that you might see as a, a flaw that I, like people make fun of my teeth. Like I have like these little kind of rabbit teeth and I love them. Like I think they're really cute, but everyone like will put a picture of me next to a chipmunk and <laughs> And things like that, but I'm like, no, I, I don't want to look like everyone else. I, you know, I want to like be myself and and embrace that. So, thank you, <laughs> thank you. So to that point, <laughs> do you want these? Now everyone's like, get her teeth, get her teeth. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people talk about how you've cultivated a very specific persona, but. A lot, I know a lot of Trainwreck, which we'll get to, is autobiographical, and a lot of your comedy is autobiographical. So how do you balance that? How much is real? How much is hyperbole? I don't know what that means, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think with my stand-up, it, it started out very much as like a, a persona and a stage character, kind of like deranged Stepford, Stepford wife looking, kind of like um, saying really racist. That, you know, that was like a character. and. Uh, I've gotten closer and closer to who I actually am. Like I, I think on stage, I've gotten a lot closer to who I really am. And I'll still throw a line in there, like, you know, that where I'm playing kind of a dimwit. But, uh, but, getting further and further from that in stand-up. And then, but on my TV show, I, I love playing a monster. I love playing like the worst idiot I can think of, 
Which is funny because a lot of girls will come up to me and they're like, I'm you. And I'm like, I'm making fun of this. Like, I, <laughs> that's not good. That's not good. Um, but I think you, you can point out the problems uh, with playing a character like that. So there's definitely, my show, I'm either playing like a total monster or a complete victim. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I think I'm, I'm both of those things. So, And so people just assume, like, you play promiscuous <laughs> drunks a lot. How do, how do I put this delicately? <laughs> <laughs> but do so many people come up to you and assume you're slutty or I wish. A drunk? No, um, <laughs> I think people know that it's a major exaggeration. I mean, I think, or, or if they meet me, they'll realize that really quick. Like I, uh, yeah, those are the. That's the big difference between me and my character in the movie. And I. Look, I'm no stranger to a cock. Like, of course, I uh, sit down, sir. Please sit down. <laughs> He's like, I've heard enough. Um, uh, but the thing is, it's like th the way I get a lot of my material is I'll like, I, you know, I had an encounter with a guy one time where he had a huge penis, and it was just too much for me to handle, and so I, you know, got out of there. Like, I'm like, what am I trying, what am I trying to prove here? So, <laughs> yeah, like, I was like, have a great life. And uh, so the opening scene of the movie has, you know, <laughs> there, that's there. But it, the way that it came out, I called my sister the next day, and I was in a Starbucks hungover, and I'm like, telling her what happened, and she's, we're both laughing to tears going over, this. so it's like, oh, let me try that on stage. So I've sort of accumulated these stories over a lifetime, but when you hear them all together, it sounds like I must have my leg, like just live with my legs over my shoulders, <laughs> um, which I can't do, because I'm really not flexible. I'm like the worst person to have sex with, but, uh, <laughs> but um, so I don't know if you were even asking this, but like, I. I, I mean, I completely like uh, love sex and don't feel shy about feeling entitled to an orgasm if I'm having sex with somebody. But uh, that um, I don't, I don't really have that much of it, and I've been in mostly monogamous relationships. But then in between, if I meet someone and I'm attracted to them, I'm gonna have sex with them, especially if they're stupid, because like <laughs> there's a guy right now I've been texting with, and like. You know, I don't. I definitely don't see myself having like a bathing suit wedding with him, but uh, I'll probably have sex with him. Yeah, <laughs> Eric, if you're listening. Um... <laughs> so that could be in the next movie or in yeah. the next sketch. Anything is Some, fodder yeah. for that. Yeah, but I always get guys' permission if it's like about someone really specific. I make sure, even if I don't say their name, I'm like, can I? Would you mind if I do this? I would never just say it. So when you went on Howard Stern, you got permission from your ex to yeah, talk about him. Yeah, of course. Is that the Howard Stern conversation that Judd called you after, or is that the most recent Howard Stern? There are lots of Howard there are, Stern I've been on there. I've been lucky to be on there. Um, I don't know which one. Judd heard me talking about my dad, and okay. I think that's what, uh, what but I'm, yeah, I don't, I don't know which time. Yeah, I'll blend. Okay, so as your n new Schumer Avatar origin story goes. <laughs> yeah. He heard you on Howard Stern mm -hmm. and then called you up and was like, I want you to tell your story. I think you have stories to tell, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what he said. Um, he said, yeah, that he, like, Judd is like a fucking oracle. I mean, seriously, he just like can see, if you look at people like that are huge stars now, he put them in movies before you knew who they were and he just has a good sense. Um, not that I'm saying, like, guys, this is the last time you'll see me because I'm about to blow up. But I'm saying <laughs> he just can tell when, when somebody could make that transition and ha has something to say and not be afraid to let themselves be vulnerable and tell a story. And, uh, yeah, so I think that's what he heard on Stern. And I was just, I think, trying to promote some road dates. So this worked <laughs> out way better. Um, <laughs> But then you gave him a script, and he sent you back to the, the drawing board. The drawing board? board? Yeah. Well, just to have the confidence to write the script would have probably never come to me without him saying, uh, I think you could do this, and encouraging me the whole time. And I think it just wasn't the right story for the time, because it was a, a story that was going on with me 
But then, you know, a year passed, and I was in a new place. And I was falling in love when I wrote Trainwreck. And I was scared out of my mind. I wasn't even enjoying it. And, so it. and it was just making me laugh that I felt kind of sick all the time. And, you know, you're just, it's like being on drugs. It's like not even fun to fall in love. And, uh, and I just, cause it was fun to go, because don't, you don't remember it that way, I don't think, until you're going through it. And then you're like, yeah, why does everyone want to be in love? It kind of sucks. And, uh, and Judd's like, why don't you talk about that? And let's, let's see what's really going on with you. And I didn't really know what was up with me. I hadn't really taken a look at myself and my behavior and, until he kind of encouraged me to do that. And was that hard? Yeah, it was really hard. It was, um, but it was, it was good. It was overwhelming. It is kind of, it does throw you off balance to fall in love. And the movie is all about, you know, a lot of people said last night, and I thought it too, it's this like great raunchy comedy with a lot of, it's very poignant. It's very sweet and it's very sad at moments, which is what being in love is about. Mm -hmm. Judd has said a lot that he's a romantic. You know, he says that sure. a lot of the stuff he does with girls, a lot of his notes are more romantic. Did he have to come in and make things, some of your stuff more romantic? No, or I love love. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, like, very hopeful, and I was raised on all the fairy tales that everyone else was, but I just noted, like, that everyone's mom is dead and that, you know, real princesses <laughs> get, like, beheaded, you know? So I, I just have a more realistic take on, on it, and so does Judd. We both have experienced a lot of pain <laughs> and, uh, and tried to do our best to cope with it by making ourselves and people laugh. And, uh, but no, it wasn't like, why don't you soften her a little bit? I don't think, maybe, now that I'm saying that. Uh, but no, I feel like I'm good at towing the line of like, what's unforgivable and what's not. <laughs> Did you consider any other titles, or was Trainwreck it all the way through? It was always Trainwreck. Yeah, it was going to be Trainwreck or Cum Dumpster. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> my publicist had to fly out early, and sh that's her fault that I just said that. So, Hi, Carrie, if I you're listening. I can't wait to see <laughs> NPR, how they're going to write that. Just so see, asterisk. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about guest stars and casting. So in Trainwreck, you have Colin Quinn, who's amazing as your father. You have LeBron James. You have Tilda Swinton as a men's magazine editor. You've got Method Man. Um, and on the show, on your show, you've had Paul Giamatti as God, which was meant to be. Beyond, like, forget what, it, everything. Truth. <laughs> Josh Charles, Rachel Dratch, Parker Posey. How do you get these people on board, right? Like, what do you do? I think they're confused. Like, they show up. <laughs> And I'm like, we don't have trailers. Uh, and they're like, oh, cool, soup kitchen. Um, uh, I think a lot of people just that are performers just want to play. And I think they trust that, um, that it, it'll be somewhere where they'll have fun, just like a fun day of shooting. And, and I think they think the show's funny, and they want to be a part of it. Yeah, because at first you're like, you just think these people need millions of dollars and but they're like they're performers and they want to have fun so um yeah this season the guest stars are it's almost embarrassing it's just like who like we got a uh, jeff goldblum in your face uh <laughs> john hawks um method man makes an appearance and uh yeah it's it's pretty insane this season dratch is back we want to get everybody to come back okay. also. And yeah, just people that it will blow your mind. Like, why would they do this show? Dennis Quaid. <laughs> Maybe because this season has a new theme? Oh, yeah. This is the season of the ass. OK, tell um, me more. Well, I, as someone with an ass, I, uh, the, I feel like it used to be just like black guys were into ass. And then now all of a sudden white guys want in because Nicki Minaj made like one video and they're all like, well, maybe I think I might like ass. And uh, I'm just like, it's too late, white guys. Um, you know, my whole life I'm like, oh, this isn't mine. I'm holding it for a friend. But now, so anyway, I just feel like ass is in this year. And in the writer's room, we just kept being like, this is the year of the ass. So um, when they talked about marketing the TV show, I was like, let's just have it be all ass. Let's just like weirdly do campaigns where one of them, I'm in the front of a spin class, in the back of a spin class. So you, it's just me and just people standing, riding bikes. And 
it's just all the marketing's like just a pyramid of asses. So <laughs> we're like, let's just embrace what's going on in the world. And there's there's a lot of ass themed sketches. It's very topical. <laughs> Um, I was watching this first season sketch about, I think it was the first season with the two spies where the, <laughs> the male spy gets to do all the fun stuff and the female spy named, codenamed Butterface, yeah. um, has to distract the villain with sex acts and literally her spy weapon is a scrunchie. To hold her hair back. Yeah, to yeah. Hold, obviously. <laughs> so with something like that, what comes first, the issue you want to address or the sketch idea? The, well, it's like that was pitched and it was like, because we were all watching The Americans and just thinking about spy movies and no matter how trained the woman is, it's always like, okay, cool, now you gotta fuck the guy. And, uh, <laughs> and then I think Jesse Klein, who's the head writer of the show, she came up with, I think, Butterface. Um, the guy's code name is Crossbolt. Like everything he gets to do is amazing. He gets to like rappel down a building and, and I just have to like cook the guy dinner and blow him. And, uh, <laughs> And I'm like, I can like disarm a nuclear sub, and he's like, that won't be necessary. Um, <laughs> so I think a lot of them go hand in hand. We'll have like kind of an issue we want to, or something we want to point out, and then the jokes and just taking it as far as we can. So what's too far? We talked once about the sketch where you pop out of a birthday cake, <laughs> which is a ridiculous. I wrote that one. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was. Uh, that was, I just, my friend was popping out of a bur her boyfriend's birthday cake, and I just thought that was the saddest thing I'd ever heard. Like, if your relationship's in a great place, you're not gonna pop out of a cake. Like, it's just, <laughs> like, look at me, please. So I just thought, <laughs> and I was just daydreaming about that, and I thought, so in the scene, I'm like, you don't know I'm in a birthday cake. You just see that I'm in a tight space, and it's, the scene is all just a tight shot of my face, like a little light coming in, and then I'm overhearing, you can hear that I'm going to surprise someone, and I'm overhearing. I hear my boyfriend come in, and I'm like, Ooh. and he's just talking about how uh, I've gained weight, and he's going to break up with me, and just all this stuff with his friend. Just tra he's like, I just feel like we're friends now, you know? She just, God, her voice makes me sick. It's just horrible. I thought the worst thing I could imagine, and then, uh, but I still have to pop out of this fucking cake, you know? So, and then you realize I was like in Iraq serving in the military. So that was just like an added layer. But uh, yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> A lot of the scenes I realize are, I love the Twilight Zone, and I think a lot of them are kind of like the Twilight Zone, just a living nightmare. And uh, yeah, so a lot of them just come from an idea of what do I think would be the worst case scenario. Have you seen anything since you've been at South By that has given you any sketch inspiration? Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, my sister and I do this thing where when we're in the car, we pretend like we see someone outside and we think it's each other. So. There was like, um, so it doesn't have to be a person. It could just be like a bag of trash. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll be like, Kim, get back in the car. And she's like, no, I'm in the car. That's a bag of trash. And, <laughs> and I feel like every city has like a pack of pretty young kids that are very tan and very dirty. And they always have like a big menacing dog. You know, like, <laughs> right? Every city, like, and they're wearing do-rags and they're kind of mean. And, uh, and that's like, all of Austin. <laughs> so um, Seinfeld recently said that it's, it's so rare and so hard to find a new light of humor that nobody cares who it's coming from or where it's coming from. I don't think that there are any barriers to women in comedy. What do you think about that? Wait, I need to like break that down. Um, say it, say it again. He said, I mean, the full quote is, it's so rare and it's so hard to find a new light of humor. Nobody cares who it's coming from or where it's coming from. If someone comes along and they're funny, it's always welcome. I don't think that there are any barriers for women. I agree. I mean, I, I agree. I think uh, if you're funny, you're funny and people seek it out. I think, um, I don't think there are, I, I think my favorite comedians and comedic actresses, I, I mean, I, I've always, I feel like there's always been an abundance of funny women. I grew up loving Gilda and Carol and Lucille Ball and Whoopi Goldberg. And, uh, and Julie Louis-Dreyfus is, I think, the funniest person alive, probably. Um, her or Tina. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's other, everything else is fucking annoying being a woman, but <laughs> the comedy barriers, I've, I've had a really nice, 
I mean, I've been doing stand-up for over 10 years, and if you could see the hotel rooms I've stayed in, like, I've done my time, but I've had a sweet path. So, um, yeah. I get it, Seinfeld. <laughs> so <laughs> He's on the show. Is he on the season? Yeah. Um, so, and yet people are really scared of the word feminism. Yeah. People, why are women, you are not scared of the word feminism at all. No. I'm going to get it tattooed on my clit. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Universal's like, is it too late to reshoot with Jessica Biel? Um, I, uh, I think people don't know what the word feminism means. So what does the word feminism mean? Well, I'm one of those people. No. Um, <laughs> social and... Uh, and political equality for women. Like I think if you're against that, you're crazy. You're a crazy person, or you don't know what it what it means. Um, yeah, and that we don't actually have it is is a, a bummer. It seems like we should be further along. I but think that's why it was so exciting to to see Patricia Arquette, you know, shout that out about equal pay because. Uh, it's it's like insane that it's still an issue. But there's definitely a million. Issues and 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 I think there's still that weird association with the word feminist and I don't know I think people are afraid for some reason they're they're they've always been there's some cultures that it's completely based on the fear of women and I don't know like it's, Twitter <laughs> yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> speaking of Twitter. Um, you get trolled, I mean, I was looking through your Twitter feed, you get trolled all the time. And you do answer some people. Does it Wait, troll you? means mean? Yeah, people oh, like really? ripping you apart. <laughs> <laughs> You've answered some people. Um, well, I don't, I don't answer very much, but I'll just, you know, there's always a grammatical errors when it's a troll, so I just correct. You know, I'll be like, it's you are a whore. Um, <laughs> But I mostly just respond to, to kindness. Uh, and then sometimes like to set people straight. People have said, um, have been upset that I have made rape jokes. And I'm like, listen to what I'm saying. Because I'm just trying to bring awareness to that there's other things than just the black and white rape that we've been taught. But some people just, you know, they're quick to want to get mad at you, even if you're on their team. That's a lot of what Twitter's about, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, when the train wreck trailer came out, and you're not afraid of controversy and issues, obviously, which is great, um, <laughs> Jeffrey Wells from Hollywood Elsewhere just that's went. Aw, that's what I heard. I didn't read the thing. I know him personally. He's a horrible human. <laughs> 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 Thank you, sir. I didn't read it. I didn't read the thing. He I'm said not... some terrible things, and I'm not going to say what he said exactly, but you just It went... says here your pussy is trash. No, Amy, respond. No. <laughs> I'm so glad you said it, because I wasn't going to read that off the page. No, I didn't read it. Um, but you tweeted some like great pictures in response. But does this get to you? Does this stuff ever get to you? I did Last Comic Standing in 2007. And so since then, I've been on television in some way. And Twitter wasn't a thing, but Facebook was. And so I, I mean, I've been having people say the, the cruelest and the kindest things to me for, for a, what I feel like is a long time. So. Someone saying that uh, I'm physically disgusting doesn't change my heart rate or doesn't change the course of my day at all. I truly, from the bottom of my heart, did not give a shit at all about that. I did give a shit about, um, I tweeted a joke a, a couple days later about, um, actually, if anything, I think that's good. Because people were angry with him for saying that stuff about me. And it just, it, it let people know. like. We're okay with, with women who aren't Victoria's Secret models. We're, we can, like, we can actually fathom that somebody could stomach fucking her. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but what did bother me was I, I, there was that Ask Her More campaign, on Twitter about women uh, at the Oscars, and uh, and I just tweeted a joke. I wrote, what, what about my campaign? Ask him less, and. <laughs> Just a joke, you know. It wasn't. It wasn't to um, belittle that campaign, but then uh, a website, which has been really kind to me, always it was a girl was like wrote a whole article about that I was uh, w diminishing the message, and I was just like, "Girl, I'm on your side. Don't, 
don't attack the people who are doing the work to, for the cause, is how I felt. And she's, of course, everyone's entitled to their opinion. But that's the kind of stuff that, that, that makes me upset, not a sad human in, in LA, like, looking for attention. I don't care. Yeah. So what do you wish people would stop asking you? They harp on these things. What are questions that you get all the time that you wish people would just stop asking you? Are they real? No. Um, <laughs> mm, I mean, the people, I mean, I guess the woman thing, like, just, what, when, or you know what, it's not what they would stop asking, because, like, people are like, is it harder for women, whatever. I, if I see a female cop, I want to be like, what's it like? You know, I, I get it. I totally get it. But the, um, I'm sick of people telling me, like, usually I don't think women are funny, but I think you're funny. Because all my best friends are female comics, and they say the same stuff to them. It just, and then, you know, if you follow up with, like, you, thank you. I don't need, like, you're giving me a compliment, but then you're also <laughs> insulting my whole gender. Um, so, uh, and, and yeah, we all hear it. And then I say, well, who, or you're my favorite female comedian. Like, uh, it's like, well, well, who are your favorite male comics? And they're like, um, and they don't, you know, it's right. like, so just to put that sort of label, so label on it. What do you wish people would ask you more about? Just like, do I do squats or just stuff about my ass? <laughs> like, I wish people would ask me um, nothing. <laughs> yeah. How about just like yell out a compliment and, uh, and get out of there? No, I don't know. Um, your comedy is very specific. So how, are you, how much do you have to tone it down to host the MTV Movie Awards? Um, I don't know. Nobody's like really slapped me on the wrist yet. So I'll probably, uh, the backlash will just come after. No, I'm not like going after, <laughs> I'm not going after anybody. It's not like a roast. I'm just going to try to make people laugh and, uh, and, you know, have sex with one of the kids in Fault in Our Stars. Like that's obviously, <laughs> anybody in it, anybody in the movie is fine. What, what movies and TV shows did you grow up watching? The Muppets, out the ass, tons of Muppets, uh, right? Fraggle Rock. Um, we, wa we watched those fairy tale theater things with Shelley Duvall, right? They're <laughs> all available on Hulu, by the way. Yeah, and, uh, and then I, I loved like the Larry Sanders show. I love Carol Burnett show. I love Lucy, Laverne and Shirley. I'll talk forever, so <laughs> Kate and Allie. <laughs> Nick at Night, I got into like Donna Reed and that stuff for a little while. Um, and then, you know, as of late, I love Arrested Development, was like my favorite. And Seinfeld, of course, always. Reality TV? <laughs> Girl, <laughs> yes, all reality TV. <laughs> I, watch, I watch like the dumbest and the smartest stuff I think you can watch. I'm both of those people. Just, I'll talk about The Bachelor for like, endlessly. I can't even put a time, a, a, a time limit on that. Um, yeah, do you want to talk about it now? Or like, yeah, let's, <laughs> should we just go for it? So um, there's definitely a, I don't know if it's a trend in comedy, but I go to a decent amount of stand-up where um, sometimes the women, a lot of women wear jeans and sneakers and sweatshirts just, I don't want to say like the men wear, you dress up on stage. When you do stand-up, you always dress up. Well, if I'm doing a special or if I'm doing like a big theater, you know, it's like, I think the tickets are expensive. I can't believe how expensive they are. Um, and uh, I, I, these people are choosing to spend one of their weekend nights with you. And so I just want to kind of show respect and dress up and make it like a sense of occasion. And then the guys who open for me, like we're doing Carnegie Hall and they're still wearing a hoodie and like Converse. Um, but I, but then if I'm just doing a set trying stuff out, I'm jeans and sweatshirt and like I have to really talk myself into a bra. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I like, I like uh, both, but yeah, I don't know. I'm like, an, I, when I go to Broadway shows, I still dress up. Like, I have that old show busy idea in my head, I think. Do you dress up when you fly, too? <sighs> <laughs> oh, my God. You're, that's, you're setting me up, right? Because you know I, I dress know. like a homeless woman. Um, <laughs> there was a TMZ video that's, it's like the first time I'd ever been. I saw all these photographers, and I just, like, looked up the escalator, like, ooh, who was on my flight? Like, I didn't see. But it was for me, and... Uh, <laughs> 
Like, things were not looking good. And uh, it's funny, though. You, I mean, I don't even try to hide it. I'm going, no, no. <laughs> It just it's such a bummer to have people like take your picture and you know what? But it was kind of funny. I just started po I was wearing sweatpants, of course, and I just started like acting like I was working it. But uh <laughs> But no, when I fly and then I'll, somebody will kind of sit me down and talk to me. Unless I am doing something where I'll be on camera, I look kind of not unrecognizable, but I think if anything people like see me and they're if they recognize me, they like hope it's not me. They like <laughs> hope I look better during the day. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. I just I do you think... get recognized a lot more now? Yeah, I do. I do. But people you, are pretty cool about it. Do you like it? No. <laughs> no. I mean, I like like uh, I was walking. I was walking uh, two days ago in Chicago. No bra, Wu Tang sweatshirt, like zero makeup. Looked like Charlize Theron a monster and. Uh, <laughs> And this girl ran by, and then she ran back, and she said, thank you for what you do. I, I love your voice, whatever. And, uh, and I was like, like, did the Oprah's on walk? I was so excited. <laughs> uh, and then I was like embarrassed for how I looked. But, um, but I, um, I don't know. It, I mean, fame seems like a complete and utter bummer. Like, there seems to be no plus side of that. Um, do you Google Sorry, I, as a comic, like you're so weird. You, I hear every sip of a drink someone's taking. Every so, somebody like touches like uh, Werther's in their pocket. I'm like a dog. Like, eh. <laughs> Sarah Silverman's like that too. Actually, I think a lot of female comics are like that. Does it bug you when you hear that stuff? Like, does it like set off some sort of trigger? N no, and I just hear it. I'm just like aware of every little. I mean, I, I don't think that's a comic thing. Like, if you go see a show, all I can think about is like hearing the guy next to me. Like futz with something in his pocket or something. Yeah, they announce at the beginning of shows now, like don't unwrap your candies before the really? show. Really, I, I feel so bad because I don't make, mean to make you feel bad. The girl, woman who just did that, like, totally. <laughs> I bet you like sore throat. Like, but I just, yeah, sorry. In other news, so you you've talked a little about being branded a a sex comic. Yeah. Um, but you know, you called your I think it's the 2012 stand-up special mostly sex stuff. Yeah. Um, do you not want to be branded that way? Um, no. Well, in, in calling the special mostly, I mean, I just, in working on the material, I brought it to Comedy Central, and I said, like, this is my special. And they said, it's a lot of sex stuff. Maybe work some more racist stuff out. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, well, let's just call it mostly sex stuff. And they were like, OK. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, sex sells, for sure. And so the naming of my TV show and and that stuff. And I'm a sexual person, and I, li I like talking about it. Um, but that that's the thing. I, I do feel like it's a there's a double standard, and it's just a lot of my favorite male comics talk about sex a lot, but they wouldn't be they wouldn't be labeled that way, you know. Like people would come up to me after a show, like the promoter, and be like, "That was a lot about sex." You're, you're kind of, and I'm like, get the fuck out of here, you know? <laughs> Do you say that to Louie? Do you say that to Attell when they get off stage? Uh, so, yeah, it's like, I don't, I, 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 the double standard of that bothers me. Do you feel like you have a responsibility to be, this is going to be a weird phrase, mm -hmm. but a role model to young comedians? Do you, do you feel like, are there mentors in the comedy world? I think so. I mean, yeah. Chris Rock right now is coming and watching me do stand-up and giving me notes for my next special just because he's a good dude. and want, I mean, he does it with Louie. He does it with other friends. And, uh, and I definitely like try to reach out and help younger comics. And people l took me on the road with them when I still totally sucked. And, um, and I, uh, I... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm a role model. I think, uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> so what's, what's the kind of takeaway that you want, like what, what do you want people to take away from Trainwreck? When they walk out of Trainwreck, which a lot of people I know haven't seen and won't be able to see until the summer, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> but what, what do you want people to sort of walk away saying? Uh, I think... Well, I want people to laugh, and I want them to leave feeling like they really laughed, and have that kind of buzzy feeling after you see uh, a good romantic comedy. And but I want them to think 
maybe I'll judge people a little less quickly and be, be a little slower to label them because I don't, you don't know their story and, uh, and feel better about themselves. Were there any scenes from the movie that you were bummed that got cut, it, cut out? No. <laughs> I'm not. I don't think so. I mean, there's so, we had so many jokes and so many moments, but, but I love the cut of the movie right now, and we shot way more than we used, but uh, no. I mean, my friends who got cut out of the movie would probably be pretty annoyed to hear me <laughs> say that, but no, I really like, like it. How it is. So you said when you were working on it, just timeline-wise, you were falling in love? Yeah. But by the time it got made, was that over oh, and done with? Before the second table read, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so was it hard to continue doing it? Did it make it harder? Uh, no, I was going to be starring in a Judd Apatow movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that guy was a sex addict, I found out. And, uh, you know, and that's always really fun at first. <laughs> When you don't know yet, and you're just like, oh my god, I'm like the prettiest girl in the world. But then it's like, no, he would like fuck this table. Um, <laughs> which is why I'm dressed like this. Uh, but no, there were no hardships in, in that. I was over it. Yeah. So we're going to take some questions from the audience in a minute. But so you can go up to the mics that I think are set up. But before we do, what advice would you give to your 16-year-old self? My 16-year-old self. What was going on with me then? Um, hmm. I would say you're going to gain weight. You're going to get HPV. <laughs> and that's OK. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess we can start out here. Yeah, OK, cool. Hi, Amy. Thanks hey. for being here. Um, quick question: When you were starting out in your early stages, who was um, the one? The, who who were the comedians, or maybe one comedian that you really aspired to to open for? Because that's how you start out. You open for other comics, and wh what what was that moment when you actually got that break that a comic came up to you and said, "Hey, can you open for me?" Um, Jessica Kirsten is the first New York comic to let me open for. Her. She's hilarious. Yeah, just the funniest person you'll ever see, and. Um, so I was so excited to get to open for her. But I also, she kills so hard that I just thought, well, I'll never be able to do that, but I'll be able to figure out what my thing is. So even now, if I see people like physically laughing, I'm like, oh my god, I never thought I would be able to do this. So uh, Jess Kirsten. But then, I mean, I I've, I've opened for so many people. But yeah, like David Tell's my favorite comedian. And so to get to open for him, I was just like, this is the best, just because I got to watch him every night. Uh, was that your question? Yeah, but the first time uh, that happened, were you pressured into questioning yourself, like, am I funny enough for this? No, because you know you're not. Like, you're just, you're, <laughs> no. It was, and, and it's always good to do something when you're not totally ready yet. Like, the first time I did a college, I was supposed to do an hour. I probably had, like, 10 funny minutes. Uh, but then I, it ca I caught up to myself, and yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Why? Who are you opening for? <laughs> um, you, hopefully soon. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for a terrific film. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Bill Hader uh, was so amazing as a romantic lead. I wonder, was there pushback from the studio saying, "No, we need Paul Rudd or somebody <laughs> who's like a bigger"? He's always playing the second banana. Are they not banana. the same person? What's going on? <laughs> No, was there, I don't think, I think this, I mean. They were, they were signed on for Bill at all? Because it's, I've never seen him in a big studio picture. I think Judd, like, saw this for him for a long time. Judd, Judd's known him forever. And we, we auditioned, but I read with a lot of people, and Bill and I just hit it off like crazy. Just had the best time. We're just killing each other on set, just laughing so hard. And, yeah, there was kind of no, no question. And. I mean, if the studio said okay to me, I'm sure they said okay to Hater. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a great movie. Revolutionary. Thank you so much. Thank you. One of the things I love about your show that uh, Trainwreck also has in common with it is that there are a lot of layers to unpack. It's uh, complex. There are different ways to look at things. Uh, you know, in, in a way, I looked at Trainwreck as 
a bit of a deconstructing, a deconstructive of a, of a princess narrative uh, in a way. Thank you. I, I wonder w- what types of stories you would like to see attacked from another angle um, than maybe is conventionally done. Is there something that, that would be the, the kind of thing, like the Twilight Zone, like things that you mentioned that you liked seeing that would make you set up a notice that you really want to see out there somewhere? Yeah. I mean, I'm lucky that I get to kind of moonlight in all these different uh, areas on my TV show. So it's like, we are doing a scene where I play a princess this season. and uh, But just a realistic look at what, what that actually entails. And I just like things being really humanized and broken down. And uh, and I, I don't know. I, I want to see... Um, I want to see a lot. I want to see... Uh, I don't know, like a really good horror movie that ends in like an orgy seems cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know. What are you hoping I say? I, I had no idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I hope I answered it okay. It yeah, was I wanna... magnificent. It was the best answer of the day. <laughs> Thanks, man. Hi, Amy. Um, hey. as, as somebody that works in the artist representation side of the business, I was just wondering if you could speak to to the degree that you feel comfortable talking about the impact that a great manager like Jimmy Miller has had on your career, especially in the last um, couple of years. I'm still trying to understand why Jimmy Miller is in my life, and uh, <laughs> I think Will Ferrell feels the same. And actually, Jimmy, we're both leaving you, and we thought we should tell you that today. Uh, <laughs> can, can we have a meeting after this, then? Of course. I've been looking to phase him out for some time. <laughs> yeah. Jimmy Miller is my manager, and also hilarious. Um, and his outfit today, he looks a lot like a substitute gym teacher <laughs> who didn't know he was going to have to work today. Uh, where are you, Jimmy? He left. He's probably like, I think he has my phone. So, you got to go hang out with Will. That's not gym. good. Yeah. I'm his like, least famous client. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk, because he obviously left. So <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> hey, um, I'm a big fan. Uh, Thank thanks you. for having, like, a type of comedy that's not clean because I feel like a lot of people kind of force you to like to be famous to be successful. You have to be clean, uh, and it's hard because life's not clean all yeah. the time. Um, but how do you go like it, when you have writer's block? How do you overcome that with like jokes and your show? Uh, writer's block. I I write on stage a lot. I, I do stand up so much. Like I'm not gonna see my apartment. Till like mid-April, because uh, I'm on the road doing stand-up. So I write a lot on stage, and then just hang out with other comics. I just feel like c- creative, and like those juices have been flowing. So I haven't had like a major block for a just while. Like, you just riff with other comedians. Yeah, we just, I mean, just we just trash each other. Like it's just <laughs> the meanest. My friends are like the meanest group of people, and we just, you know, someone walks in. Like if I walked in wearing, like the, they would just trash me. They would just. Yeah. Even just hearing me talk about like how I'm doing what I'm doing, they would just rip me apart. And so I think that keeping each other humble but also on your toes, ready mm-hmm. to fire back, cool. keeps keeps me pretty sharp. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Amy. Hi. Hi. Third year actor. <laughs> this is very James Lipton. <laughs> okay. Well. Anyways, um, I'm a I'm a young comedian here in Austin. Get it, girl. Uh, right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm trying really hard. Um, So I wanted to first thank you for the comedy that you put out there. Um, It's really inspirational to me. Thank you. Especially as somebody that also gets made fun of for my teeth. Oh. I feel you. I can't see them, but I bet they're gorgeous. Oh, and I can see. They're super cute. Yeah, thanks. (laughs) I appreciate it. that noise. Um, Yeah, yeah, right? Um, So I am in like a male-dominated field, obviously. You know this. I have a sketch troupe that's mostly guys, and a lot of the time I have to justify my dirty jokes. And, you know, it, I find it difficult sometimes. So, I don't know, you kind of mentioned that you don't, really, you don't really give a shit, which I think is awesome. And my parents also, you know, raised me to believe that I'm, like, the, the best. Shit. Yeah. Right, which, you know, great. Clearly, I am to yeah. myself. Um, so how do you deal with that? Do you I still would deal leave with that? that sketch group. Like, why do that? You know what I mean? Like... Get out of there. Just surround yourself with people that, that you know, keep you on your, your path that you want to work right. with, I would say. But, um, and then just as much stage time as possible because well, the audience lets saying. you know. Yeah, yeah, that's just like a, 
the audience is, is gospel. It's like, if they're not laughing, you can't be like, no, 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 but you don't get it. Like, <laughs> but wait, but wait. this is why, you know? Um, but uh, what was the question? I, I mean, I don't I know. Well, I have one more. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I do have a sketch troupe now with my best friend, Elizabeth. It's called Two Girls, One Pup. So um, Gold. check us out sometime. Um, Endlessly Googling. Awesome. And if you said, you know, you're into mentoring. So uh, my name's Allie. Allie. OK, got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hit you up. I mean, maybe we'll wind up working together. You don't, you don't know. Yeah. Mm. I'll be like begging you to let me do like a role in your movie, and you'll be like, ah, uh, pass, thanks. <laughs> never, that would never happen. Yeah, all right, thanks, Thank girl. Hi, Amy. You, you. Thank you so much for being here and for bringing Trainwreck here. It so was cool. an incredible movie. Thanks. Um, and I can't wait to see it again this summer, like Thank counting you. down the days. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about your process in creating a fictional version of a personal story? Because I know it's something that's really hard for a lot of writers starting out and striking that balance between like wanting to keep every detail, but yeah. also creating something for a wider audience. Well, Judd was really good at being like, let it go, bitch. <laughs> like, that's not important and it'll slow it down. And I was like, okay, not being too precious with that. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, so, it's, you know, the character's name's Amy, and it's, there, there are a lot of parts of her that I can fully relate to, and I would say sophomore year of college is when I sort of did the most sleeping around, and I was just like, I kind of like lost myself in, in college and didn't really, uh, my self-esteem just like left my body, and you know, you, you really know who you are by the end of high school, I think, and then it's just r ripped away from you and no one prepares you for that, so I was kind of like, Samantha on Sex and the city -ing and being like, they can't hurt me, you know. And I was just probably in a lot of pain. And uh, so a lot of it was kind of going back and thinking about that time. So it's always something that I can kind of connect with. You know, if I'm, that at a moment in my life at least, I, I had some connection to it. Um, yeah, so I think, like my acting training is in Meisner, so you're supposed to be living truthfully under these imaginary circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, to be able to do that the best, you need to have had some version of it happen to you. And so I, uh, oh my god, if like any of the guys at the comedy store had just heard me say that, they would like honestly <laughs> <laughs> just like punch me in the face. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if that is helpful Thank at all. Thank you. All right. Oh my god, I'm so sure. <laughs> um, hi, Amy. Hey. Um, okay, so you mentioned how your new season's all about asses. So how many squats do you do a day? Thank but you. <laughs> mm. Okay, but zero. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my god, I was just thinking about that. But uh, so you do stand up, and as well, you do film, theater. Which one is like your preference? Uh, I really like. Like I mean, this is my first movie, but I've I've always done plays and stuff, and I, I really like both. There was this time where I was opening for Jim Norton, another one of my favorite comics, and uh, I was opening for him at Caroline's, and I was also in a play uh, off Broadway where I um, was playing this woman who everybody thought I was beating beating my child, and it was like really heavy, and then it was really light, and I like the mixture. I love I love both. I hope I can do I hope I can do both. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you spoke last night about uh, Trainwreck being a bit of a love letter to New York, but yeah. it's a different love letter than we usually see in rom-coms with like a tells character and some <laughs> of the voiceover. And I was wondering, do you have a problem, not a problem with, but did you want to depict a New York that was more familiar to you than what we usually see on screen? Um, I wanted it to be my New York, and uh, my first apartment was, uh, after college, was in Chinatown, and. Uh, it was a dump, and uh, I actually got a roommate off Craigslist for a studio. Um, <laughs> hi. And, uh, and I wanted to show that. And you know what? It's like, that, that really is like how I feel like it is in New York. It's such a, it's an island. It's so little, and so you wind up, everybody's on the subway together. It's such a, and, and I used to have uh, this, this guy, William. He was this homeless guy. He lived in my stairwell um, when I lived in Murray Hill. And every day, I would just kind of like step over him and be like, hi, William, how are you? And he, he always just wanted you to buy him booze. So 
Um, sometimes I would just like bring him back because this wasn't a dude that was like gonna find his way back, you know. Like he had like n parts of his leg left. Like it was it was over for him. He wasn't gonna like pursuit of happiness himself out of there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he um, and one day he wasn't there, and I went to like you know the place he usually went to like shit, and I went to the liquor store, and I'm like. Where's, I haven't seen William, and they're like, he died. And it broke my fucking heart, and you know, I just kind of mourned him, and, and then he like, I saw him in Union Square like a month later. <laughs> and he had just moved, I, and I went to the liquor store, like, William was fucking in Union Square, and they were like, oh, we just figured he, and I was like, hey, you know. <laughs> so, so, I mean, even some of the New york -y things that might seem like a little bit of like a device, I don't think are, it's, that is my, yeah, Alice's Teacup and Upper West Side. Like that's my my New York though. And Jody Lee Lips, who did uh, Lips, who did the he was the DP. He did Girls and Tiny Furniture and Marcy Marley Mar <laughs> cult, cult rape one. He um he he just shot it so beautifully. A way I feel like I've never really seen it. And we shot on film, which you know New York's just gonna look super pretty on film. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I'm probably like the third young comic to talk to you within the past 10 minutes. So sorry about Very that. Very welcome. We're just kind of like <laughs> That's a That's such a comic thing, I like guess. just apologizing for like breathing. Yeah. <laughs> I do it all the time. I actually, speaking of which, I apologize for having sex sometimes. I don't know. I, you know, I feel kind of. So are you like, is this your first day as a comic or? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know. Thanks for that. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm getting in kind of trouble because I'm starting to get a little bit more personal with my material. Yeah. Uh, and I'm in a monogamous relationship. And has there ever been a point in your life, because you're very open about your sex life and sex, um, has there ever been a point where you've gotten in trouble, like personally in your personal one-on-one -on -one relationships? Uh, and how'd you handle that? Yeah, I've, I've really been pretty good about clearing it with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but when I first started out, I, you know, things that I feel really comfortable talking about, just some of my girlfriends, because um, I, you know, I talk about how like we were all sluts growing up, like all the girls I was friends with. And there was one of them that was like, and, and of course she was the biggest slut of all of us and she had the <laughs> biggest problem with it. Um, and uh, yeah, like I yeah. just didn't have to be in her wedding, so I didn't have to buy like a whack Vera Wang dress and like <laughs> go uh, spend a grand to ride in a limo with uh, her new friends. Um, <laughs> but but personal life mm -hmm. stuff, I mean, I, I, yeah, I've always cleared it with them. So mm -hmm. if you really like whoever you're dating, maybe like oh, shut I the did. fuck up. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Oh. No, that's what yeah. I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, right, then, thanks. good talking to you. We both did the same thing. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just know as a comic, you travel around a lot. You've played, uh, or you've uh, done stand up all over. And on Jimmy Fallon, I believe, you talked about the worst you ever bombed. Oh, yeah. I think, yeah, it was like a web thing. But I was wondering what your weirdest show was. Um. Well, that question walked half the crowd. Um, <laughs> my weirdest show was doing a hunger strike in DC. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I actually every show in LA is a hunger strike. Um, <laughs> that's funny, right? Will you text me that I said that? Um, <laughs> yeah, I was walking past the White House. I was in town doing the improv opening for David Tell, and there was a group of people, and they looked. Super bummed out. And this woman was like, will you come over here? And uh, she's like, what do you do? And I was like, oh, I'm a comedian. And she was like, oh, well, will you please do stand up for these people? And uh, I was like, uh, no, what? <laughs> and uh, I, called, I called Norton, and I was like, what should I do? And he's like, you got to take the gig. I was like, what? It was like during the day. People were wearing signs on their chest of how many days they haven't eaten. And, and, uh, and I was like, all right. So I kind of, some things you just do because then you won't be afraid to do anything ever again. So I did it. I did like 10 minutes of stand up. And the people were like, can you just picture this? Like they're, they're laughing like this. This was me killing them being like, 
<laughs> and um, yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I bombed, of course, and then I, and then I later found out it was like for a known terrorist organization. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, um, I'm mad. But so yeah, that, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I work for a film festival based out of Indiana. It's called Middle Coast. And on our website, we're actually doing celebrity looks lookalikes for the people in it. And last night, they were like, Jensen, what do you look like? And I was like, I don't know. And they said, you look like Amy. And I was like, OK, I I'm accept. a celebrity, <laughs> yeah. So um, I was just wondering if we, I could give a picture with you after this to kind of uh, prove Well, god, how weird it will be down. if I say no. Like, um, <laughs> yes, let's yes. do it Kay. for your film festival, Turncoats. Thank you. What is it? Midcoast? Middle coast. Middle coast. Oh, middle coast. Midwest. That makes way more sense than <laughs> just like mid coast. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey. Hi. Uh, so I'd like to know how it was to tackle screenwriting. I don't know if that was something that you had done in the past, but um, I, I would like to know about that. And also, did you already know that you had LeBron James and some of these other people, or were you just kind of writing jokes and then figuring it out afterwards? I totally wrote like Tilda Swinton type and just thought LeBron James was a placeholder for okay. like whoever we'd be able to get and then Judd Apatow is Judd Apatow and so they were like yeah we'll do it and uh, um, so yeah I, I didn't know um, until we, we were like well into writing that they were gonna be into it um, and what was the other thing? Well, the other one was just about oh screenwriting yeah. oh no I'd I'd written one script before for Judd and. Yeah, like I read a screenwriting book as I was writing. And Judd would, <laughs> I had like just bought Final Draft on my computer. <laughs> and Judd, uh, you know, he would be like, like, none of the writers on my TV show had any like software for script. We were all just like, what? A sketch? <laughs> what is that? And then he, uh, yeah, he just really encouraged me the whole time. And yeah, because he, had he been like, ah, this isn't that, I would have been like, oh, yeah, yeah, totally. I'll just go back to trying to get those half price wings. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, man. Hey, uh, the screening last night was titled to say "Work in Progress." Uh, is was that just a safety tag in case people didn't like it, or is there still things that are going to change? <laughs> Not a word. Do you understand what? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> G'day, mate. Uh, there were a couple scenes that had never been screened before, and so I think if those had bombed, they would have gone away. But I don't think that there'll be very much of a change at all, especially with how like awesome everyone was. I hope everybody wasn't just like high, because awesome. they were such it a great really crowd. <laughs> yeah. What? Which thing? The, um, well, we'd never watched the bathroom one before when Vanessa and I are, are peeing next to each other, talking about Johnny Depp. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, a bunch of scenes like that. <laughs> we have time for these last okay. two. Cool. Um, so, first of all, I just totally love the way you make me laugh. Thank You're like you. Definitely one of my favorite comedians. That's the best. Um, and loved the movie last night. Felt like it had such a brand of you in it, Thanks. and it really brought both sides: the comic side and then the the real personal side. Thank you. And the my favorite like surprise in the movie was LeBron James. I, like I was going to ask, he asked a little bit earlier if you wrote that for him, but I couldn't believe how funny he was and how great the part was written for him. So I was just going to ask you more about what it was like having LeBron James on set. Um, like as someone who truly does not care at all about sports, I um, <laughs> I I've still never seen him play basketball, <laughs> um, but. He, I watched some interviews with him, and he just seemed super fun. But he was, like, we were shocked. He was so hilarious and not precious about anything. We were like, can we ask him to joke about, like, clean? And uh, he was like, yeah, like, he was totally into doing it. And he was so not intimidating to hang out with. He's just, like, just the best dude. Yeah. But it's fun, because I think that one of the biggest jokes is just that he's, like, the second time you see him, because you just assume, oh, that's like what the cameo was. And then he's like, no, you kind of can't get rid of him. <laughs> it's all over the movie. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, were you upset when Jade got voted off The Bachelor? When, uh, when Jade got voted off? I don't know. Like, <sighs> he seemed like fine with her, her nude pictures. You know, he was like, oh, that doesn't define who you are. But then he yeah, knocked then her off, and you're like, bullshit. well, 
what's up, Chris? Like, she said she would go to that fucking farm with you, so. <laughs> I was a little bit of, yeah, I was a little bit of that. Um, yeah. I really wanted to ask, what's next so. for you? Uh, I'm gonna watch the next season of The Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, I'm on the road all the time, and I uh, this third season of my show is coming out April 21st at Comedy Central. Yeah, I really am so proud of this season. So if you had never heard of me before, please watch the show. And um, yeah, movie bless awards. you. MTV Movie Awards. Well, that's MTV it, right? Movie. And then I'm gonna go to dental school. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. And I just want to say. Um, just thank you guys so much. It's it's really this is a completely new experience for me, and I love Austin for real. And uh, it's been one of my favorite towns to stand up in. And just just for you guys showing up today, like it's it's not wasted on me at all. It's, I'm so excited about this whole process, and thank you guys for being so nice. And I want to thank the festival, Janet. Thank you. That's it. Oh, okay. All right. And so for me, you pick your co-conspirator or conspirators carefully because you're going to be with them in a very meaningful and close, intense relationship. And in a lot of ways, I've been lucky with that. Like, he never died. The, the, the director, uh, Jason, he's just one of the more interesting thinkers I've ever met. I trust him indefinitely. Working with him as a, him as a director, you could just fall backwards. He's going to get you every time. 